Well, hello. So we are here. Uh, welcome to another Caring Conversation. I am Dr. Keisha Serbois, uh, and it is my pleasure to welcome you into tonight's dialogue. Um, the hesitation, <laughs> the hesitation you're sensing in my voice, uh, it's because this caring conversation is very, very different uh, from the rhythm of the previous caring conversations. And that's because the way this week unfolded, um, I suddenly found myself with an opportunity to change directions. Um, I had announced earlier that tonight's conversation was going to be on the fear of failure. And while I'm still prepared to talk about that, and I have the book recommendations, the way in which tonight's dialogue is actually going to unfold is dramatically different. <laughs> dramatically different from uh, what I envisioned when this started. And that's because a lot has happened this week. And, you know, sticking with my usual pattern, I am pulling up tonight's conversation so I can make sure that you see me. <laughs> And I'm still learning to put it on mute. That seems to be my consistent pattern. But um, let's walk through what we're going to experience tonight. Now, usually when we do uh, a caring conversation, you have the usual overview. Um, but no, 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 tonight's different. There will be a part two. Um, to this series on the fear of failure, because I do want us as adults to really begin to unpack the fears, uh, the stress, the past experiences that we're carrying right now, because the reason why it's so important that we address these things, as I've said in previous videos, protecting our mental health, protecting our social emotional wellness is everything right now. And in the theme of that, um, I want to do a quick meditation. Yeah, I want to do a quick meditation because if I'm talking about wellness, I want to come to you uh, in a spirit of wellness. So I'm going to take one minute and I'm just going to do some breathing. And it's just going to be a very relaxing activity. I'm going to breathe out all of the stressful things and I'm going to breathe in productivity. And I'm choosing to do it this way because I wanted to basically show what it could look like if we model these things. So you hear, you know, I got my trusty Dusty Calm app. And so I'm just going to set my timer and I'm going to do a quick breathing ex exercise and I invite you to do it with me we're gonna breathe in and then we're gonna let it go and we're gonna get still if you can you know put yourself in a seated position where you're comfortable breathe in breathe out a lot has happened this week let's Breathe in peace and stillness, and let's breathe out all of the negativity that we have encountered so far this week. Let's let all of that go. We're going to do this one last time. Breathe in with me. And let it go. And I have grown to love these simple breathing activities. Um, I was on uh, a webinar today, uh, Dr. I want to mispronounce her name, Dina Simmons. And she started her webinar by doing the breathing meditation. And I thought, you know what, that is such a great way to begin a conversation because it centers you, it helps you sort of shake off <laughs> the nonsense that may have tried to cling to you and may try to follow you 
into this moment and it allows us to really engage from a centered space. And so that's where we are today because tonight's Caring Conversation, I'm really looking to the adults, the parents. While you know my passion is parents and children and early childhood literacy, a lot has happened this week and I want to talk to the adults because when we think about the fear of failure, when we think about the stress and past experiences, it's weighing the heaviest on the shoulders of adults because you have either not dealt with some of the trauma or you're being triggered by things that may be happening right now, all of the uncertainty, all of the remote learning, all of the blended learning. And if you have your own insecurities around education or if you have your own insecurities around failure, then the idea of being so responsible for your child's education in a new school year, not the summer where you're just coming in at the end, but now you're in the beginning of a new school year. And so if you have that fear of failure, that could be weighing on you. So while we are definitely going to give this topic more attention, I wanted to be cognizant of what's happening around us right now. And so as I shared tonight, it's all about the self-care. I've already tried to set that rhythm by having the breathing exercise that we engaged in at the forefront of tonight's talk. Because everything that I've curated for you tonight is about your self-care. We are going to think about what steps you can do. And me. (laughs) And me. I do these things too. So let's see. Why are we uh, taking this deviation into self-care? Well, did you see the week? (laughs) I mean, it's only Thursday, but have you seen this week? My goodness. So let's just count it down. So this is a picture, uh, a photo taken by Noah Berger of the wildfire that's currently ripping through California right now. And the reason why the photo stands out, and it'll probably be one of those prolific photos that go down in history, is that it actually captures the pandemic of COVID right now. So you have a wildfire intersecting with the warnings and the whole protection measures that we're taking to prevent COVID-19. And as if the other detail didn't just jump off the uh, picture, it's a senior center. The population that has been the most vulnerable to this um, pandemic. And so the whole idea of a fire, (laughs) a wildfire, and then the COVID the senior city, like it's just the perfect storm of all with right now. Oh, but there's more, right? So, and it's interesting because at the same time, we're dealing with fire at one end of the country in the West Coast. Well, down south in Louisiana and Texas, they're dealing with water. They have a hurricane, a category four hurricane ripped through uh, Louisiana and Texas um, early this morning. And I don't have to tell you, both of these states have been dealing with hurricanes, heavy hurricanes. And so it's like, here you have the natural disasters occurring at the same time. But wait, what do we add to that? Gumbo of horrible incidents? Hmm. Well, let's talk about what's happening at the social level. You know, the researcher in me, I'm like, okay, uh, let's let's go from the meso, the meso to the micro, right? So we started at the top level. Now let's go to the national level. You know, like we're looking at, we looked at global weather patterns. Let's bring it down to the national level. Well, the RNC convention is happening. Um, We had another tragedy uh, with Jacob Blake. Uh, He he survived. Um, I'm being very careful in how I choose my words because 
I recognize and I honor the disabled amongst us. So I'm not going to use any language that suggests that his life is any way over because he's paralyzed. But I am definitely going to talk about the psychological toll that awaits him that's already greeting his children because he had a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and an eight-year-old in the car and they saw their father be shot uh, seven times in the back. And so the thing about, since this is early childhood, the thing about those ages, at three years old, around 90% of a child's brain is developed. Around five years old, 90% is developed. And at eight years old, you shift from reading to, from learning to read to reading to learn. And so the fact that his sons were both at these pivotal moments in their development when this happened, the psychological trauma and the need to rally around and buffer is one thing, but then every time they see their father, since he's now, as of now, paralyzed, it's going to trigger those memories. And so the devastation of what was done is what has me stunned because in one swift, horrible series of events, you have now impacted three children, two generations for the rest of their lives at these seminal stages. But it doesn't end there, right? So we also know that Jacob Blake's shooting, of course, resulted in protests. And then we have the 17-year-old that took it into his hands to be a terrorist. I mean, I don't, I don't see him as a vigilante. I, I don't apologize for that. I don't agree with that language. And you have the pundits sensationalizing this. But why I highlighted this uh, story because I think it does a great job of highlighting and illustrating the racial divide. I mean, within if you saw the video of uh, the 17 year old marching down the street with this massive assault rifle, you see the police and the uh, heavily armored police uh, vehicles drive past him. I mean, massive weapon, hands up. They just push past him and they go to the protest, the protesters who he's just assaulted. Some of them he's just killed. But I want to frame this into the deeper story. So I have shared a picture below of Tiana Arara. I hope I said your name right. She was arrested for protesting. No, no guns. Like she was um, imprisoned for it. And, you know, her quote says she believes that she was arrested uh, for protesting because she spearheaded a rally against racial injustice. And she felt like her arrest was to discourage, to send a message to other people to sort of, you know, stay in your place. So I wanted to juxtapose the two authentic stories so you can see again, because I'm you already know, but we're going to paint a picture because this is self-care day. Why the need for self-care was so strong? Because in one hand, protesters are quickly arrested. They have the fear for their life. Like the fear of standing out can result in a terrorist, you know, shooting you, killing you. The fear of spearheading a rally, the fear of standing up can result in you uh, being imprisoned that whole tactic like every time social justice tries to stand up there seems to be this concerted effort to strike fear into it and well that's historical because if you travel back a quick rewind is the Jim Crow era go a little further back you have the reconstruction era go a little further back you have the um, Civil War. And each time pockets of social justice try to rise up, this terror 
comes down on it. And so it's not too surprising that we're seeing it in 2020. But what is encouraging was yesterday when the NBA, the WNBA, the Major League Baseball League, the, I'm sorry, I don't play baseball, but the MLB, the MLS, (laughs) they all came together and uh, boycotted their games. But I understand, uh, and I'll check the news again, but the last time I um, looked at the latest headlines, I also see that they have now returned um, to the games. And so it made me think of what Kendi said and how to be anti-racist in chapter 16 of his book about the difference between demonstrating and protesting. And while I definitely acknowledge that this was a powerful statement that was made and all of them coming together in solidarity, the heavier lifting is in having the strategy to continue it and turning it into something. But I honor and acknowledge that you start somewhere. But I'm curious as to what it was like to stand out there, make a massive statement as they did yesterday, and then so swiftly return back to business as usual before any real discomfort could have occurred. And I asked this question in the light of the civil rights boycotts when they boycotted the buses. If memory serves, those boycotts lasted for several years. If, if, if at a minimum one year, I'd have to go back and check, but I do believe it was between one to three years. And they walked every day. They financially squeezed the system until they were willing to meet their demands. I don't know how effective that is compared to 24 hours in a beautiful social media campaign. But nonetheless, I honor, I honor the statements and I honor the sentiments, but I wonder where we have to go or what it will take to get to that justice. But that's a question for another day. Tonight, when we think about the fear of failure, I said all that to frame it. I think we need to consider releasing ourselves from the fear. Failure, that may come, but fear is a choice. If you look at this from a spiritual lens, fear is a form of faith. And I don't know what's going to happen, but I choose to be fearful or I choose not to be fearful. If I fail, that's something that I may have control over or I may not have control over. But usually failure is the result of effort. And the outcome of that effort may not be up to you. But choosing to be fearful of that outcome, that's your choice every step of the way. And so how do we begin to unpack this whole idea of choosing fear? Because I think fear plays a heavy hand in whispering to people to sit down to give up, to stay home, to not register, to not take that stand, to not be the first X, Y, Z. And so I, because I care, (laughs) I engaged in a uh, mini curriculum. I created five mini curriculums and I use, you know, my go-to method, talk, read, sing, play, because even at my core, even as we're dealing with adults, as we're coming to the adult lens, I'm still teaching you the same foundational concepts that you can use with littles, that you can use uh, when you engage in the literacy, reading, talk, read, sing, play. These are always my four strong foundational components. But this time, I took these segments and I expanded them for us, for adults. 
And so I'm going to show you and heads up tonight's carrying conversation may be the quickest one yet because it's not about the usual routine. I want to give you these tools and then I want to step out of the way and then I want you to breathe. I want you to take at least 10 minutes of the time that you would have spent watching a carrying conversation because they're usually an hour. I am going to step down, shorten this video in hopes that you take the extra time, maybe 20 minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and you engage in some of these activities. So within the video description, I'm going to link all of the information. If you're following me on uh, social media, Dr. Keisha Cares, you'll already see this content. You may have already seen this content because, you know, I know I have some people that are here for the cause and I appreciate you. Thank you. But um, if it's new to you, enjoy. The one in yellow is how I started. <laughs> it's how I started the series. So you knew exactly where Dr. Keisha was coming from. And I'm not going to read it because I don't know who watches this, but you can. Um, but it is important that we listen to that voice inside of us that says no. Why? Because that's usually your intuition or that's that guidance or that's that bigger sense, however you choose to see yourself within the world. That's that bigger guidance that is directing you away from harm or away from something that ultimately isn't to your benefit or something where it served its purpose and now it's time to release it. Oh, I can talk about that one. But within each one, and there's a theme in all of these images, you'll see a quote. The quotes are anti-racist. So you have diversity within the speakers. You have a global positioning within the activities. And you have a theme. And so you'll see in every image a brick image. Either it be a brick wall. There's going to be bricks somewhere in the background. Because I want the brick wall to represent that thing that we need to break through. Be it fear, be it fit past failures, but there's a brick wall. And a brick wall is intimidating. Like I didn't put, you know, a cloud or something soft. No, I, I put something that took some work. It's going to take some work to tear it down. Because I also want you to understand from the very beginning that these aren't quick things. But these are necessary tools that you can use to chip away. Chip away at the things that are holding you back, right? And so within each one of these quotes, um, and like I said, I, share, I will share the links within this video description. If you're on the Dr. Keisha Cares social media platforms or you've signed up uh, for the emails, you will start getting this. Yes, we're finally going to start sending the emails. Woohoo. Hey, Rachel. <laughs> but we're finally going to start with that. And within each of these quotes, um, there's a mini curriculum. And all you need to give is 10 minutes. There is a talk activity. I have an affirmation selected for you. There is a read Activity, I ask you to spend 10 minutes reading anything, anything that you enjoy. And you know, because I care. Of course, I have some links. You know, I'm looking out for you. I got you, boo. I got you. So you'll see a uh, read suggestion like with the talk, read, sing, play. I have provided you with a link suggestion or a dance move. You know, I'm big into moving. Uh, I really have fun with the songs. So enjoy. It is my gift to you because self-care is the gift we give ourselves. Um, I think I'm going to surprise you. I, I, I was about to share a quote with you, but I just realized I'm going to save that for another curriculum. So I'm going to pull that one back, make you wait for it. <laughs> but oh, how can I, before I leave this page, there are a few quotes that I want to share with you. Because you are alive, everything is possible. As heavy as this week was, as heavy as this year 
has been as heavy as some of our lives have been, depending on what we're carrying. The fact that we are still alive means that everything is possible. And I don't shy away from the everything. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. Your perspective determines how you choose to look at whatever wall is standing in your way. And as long as you're breathing, there is an opportunity to do something about it. And Dr. Sonia Sanchez, she poetically phrased this one so well. Let me wear the day well, so when it reaches you, you will enjoy it. How many of us are not wearing the day well? Like we're just throwing it on like you sweatpants and <laughs> making it work. <laughs> but even if you're wearing sweatpants, if you are wearing those sweatpants with joy, if you are wearing them in comfort, if you are wearing them in rest, then you're wearing it well. If you are finding ways to wear the day well, it may not be the whole 24 hours, we're human, but if you are finding ways to wear the day well, if you're a parent, you've got a reason to wear the day well. Because when you sow your seeds into the child or the little in your life, they will enjoy the self-care you've given yourself because you will be in a better position to pour into them. It's a whole different thing. And I've spoken about this in my previous videos. Uh, check out using books as band-aids. Frustration, stress, if I'm communicating. Could you imagine? <laughs> could you imagine this channel? If I try to pour into you from a space of stress, anger, fear, <laughs> could you imagine? Like, I doubt you would watch the video. Like, who, who wants that? Message, imagine your child. Imagine a little. Why do you think they would want that? So, nobody's perfect. Nobody has to be perfect. But all I'm asking you to do is take that time to center yourself, then engage. Take that 10 minutes. I have literally written out a curriculum for you. Go through these activities, center yourself. If you have to lock yourself away in the bathroom, a closet, whatever, whatever. Find that, go for a walk. Who says you gotta stay indoors? Put your mask on, go for a walk and enjoy any of these activities. I'm going to leave you with this beautiful quote uh, from Chief White Eagle. I got to move myself out of the way so I can read it. When you are in doubt, be still and wait. When doubt no longer exists for you, then go forward with courage. So long as myths envelope you, envelop you, be still, be still until the sunlight pours through and dispels the myths as it surely will. Then act with courage. I shared from the very beginning that this one was going to be a different caring conversation. We are all dealing with the mist in our lives and it feels like it's surrounding us. It may feel like we are enveloped and completely surrounded by a thick mist. Some of us may have a white fall. We don't even feel like we can see anything right now. If you are someone who experienced devastation um, from the hurricane and your life has been shattered yet again. Be still. Be still. Wait. I'm going to move myself again because it says when doubt no longer exists for you. I recently went through a painful experience. Someone attempted to murder my spirit. Yeah, it happens. 
And I had to make a choice in how I was going to respond. And so I had to follow this quote, which is why I highlighted it. I had to follow the wisdom in this quote. And I had to be still. Didn't respond to the person. They may never know because the way in which they did it, it was intentional. And so now it's up to me. Do I allow that seed to find fertile ground in my spirit and then blossom into insecurity? Or do I kick it off of the soil and sweep away any residue, do the work or dig it out of whatever soil it may have found and throw it away? Either way, I have to be still and I have to do the self-reflections. I have to have the conversations. If you have a therapist, if you choose to engage in other forms of communication, do it in a healthy way. Write. Seek professional help. Talk to your trusted circle. Work through these things. Read. Read. But as you're doing all these things, be still in your outward appearance. Don't allow your mouth to make a situation worse than it needs to be. Someone chose to put bad seeds in your garden, but you decide if you're going to water it. So be still. I love that this quote repeatedly says, be still. Because the chief is telling us that stillness is where we find the sunlight. Be still until the sunlight pours through because eventually the mist did clear and I began to see my way out of the insult, see my way out of what was intended to be harmful. It helped me reflect not only on the person but on the bigger circumstance of what that moment was saying about them and what that moment said about me and how I reacted to it internally. Then, now that I'm clear, I act with courage. What is my courageous act? I am here telling you how I got over. So you can learn from the wisdom I have just wrestled with because the nighttime is when the, 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 the mist is the thickest. And I have come out of that to say, be still. Engage in self-care. Remind yourself who you are and what you represent. Find ways to love on yourself, even if it is, <clears throat> excuse me, even if it is, for that 10 minute period. I ask you to engage for 10 minutes at a minimum within my curriculums. Give me 10 minutes and engage in one or all of the following activities. And then I list them out under the talk, read, sing, play. But the beautiful thing is once you do that, you act with courage. And so again, the curriculums, all of that, you'll find them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, it will be in the YouTube description of this video. Sign up for the emails. Go to the website. Put in your email address. We're going to start sending them out. So you're welcome to engage in the material that way. And now I know you're like, but wait a minute, Dr. Keisha, where are the books? <laughs> Where are the books? I didn't forget. I didn't forget. Let's see. There we go. <laughs> but I did forget which option to click. All right. So again, like I said, tonight is about us, the adults. So the book selections, well, I, I did pick a few uh, for you to engage in the reading aloud. But tonight I was thinking about us. So... One of the main things that helped me as I navigated the weight, it was sitting down with the elders. If you are fortunate enough to have a wise elder in your network, be it a grandmother, a grandfather, someone who has 
willingly decided that they're going to pour into you some of their bought sense, as my grandmother used to say, some of the things they earned, the lessons they earned. <laughs> this is a great time to seek the advice of the elders because we're dealing with a lot. And while I talked about self-care, self-care is also engaging in community that you trust. And sometimes you need to speak to someone who's lived a little longer than you have. And if you don't have that option, because I'm sheltering in place now, thankfully, there are people I can, you know, Zoom call, try to get on their calendars and just spend some time listening to their wisdom and let them breathe hope back into my spirit. But I want to give you a few books that are full of wisdom, some of my favorites. Shirley Chisholm, Unbought and Unbossed. This is a woman, a sore, who can certainly tell us what it is to stand up against injustice, to fight anyway. Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman, first woman, period, to run for president. And the story of how her nomination was handled, how that story ended is an even greater example of what it is to experience disappointment because the failure she experienced was not of her own making, but her ability to remain unbought and unbossed is why her words resonate in this moment. Another. Now, I'm giving you my perspective because I'm in education and I'm telling you the elders that I found hope in. Mary McLeod Bethune. McLeod. I say McLeod. Mm. Another sore. But another woman who showed us what education can do, even in the midst of the thickest racism, when... The issues we're dealing with now were compounded and multiplied, and they were still dealing with segregation in its harshest form. She was a champion for education. She was, mm, there's so much wisdom here. So here's another great suggestion, the reading. I've used this book several times, so Cultivating Genius. Because if you want to look at how do we take these lessons after we have done the care to look after ourselves, how do we pour into others as educators? How do we pour into our children as parents? Cultivating genius. I love Dr. Muhammad's work on historical literacy, historically responsive literacy. I talked about her work in several talks, but those three books are outstanding resources for you to consider on your own. Read them at your leisure. Now, the famous, I didn't forget about lit, lit, lit. So how do we talk about failure? How do we talk about fear? How do we talk about some of these difficult emotions? And as I shared, there will be a part two because tonight's talk deviated but I didn't want to leave you without some great book suggestions. So, you know, I love this series. What do you do with the problem? Well, what do you do with the chance? Because within every experience of failure, there's a decision to be made. And that decision represents a chance for a different outcome if you decide to get back up and try again. If you decide to continually put yourself out there, you may encounter a chance, a chance to do something differently, a chance to be invited to participate in an opportunity, a chance to pay it forward, or a chance to learn. Either way, it's an option. And so that's why I thought this was an outstanding book, because it helps you explain what a chance is. And you know, it talks about what happens when you ignore a chance or when you get all of these chances and you do nothing with it or you get that chance and you try it and you fail and you're embarrassed. So when the next chance comes along, maybe you don't 
take it? How do you find that courage to try again? I think I'm going to leave you with one more. Well, I shared three books. Okay, I'm going to share three children's book. Ever, ever the equitable teacher. One of my favorites, If You Plant a Seed by Kadir Nelson. Now, you know I love his illustrations and I love his writing. But um, this story just talks about the power of sharing, what it means to be in community. And it's a beautiful story that resonates with this moment because a lot of the things we're dealing with, a lot of the fear we're facing is because we're dealing with scarcity mindsets. This belief that if you get yours, there'll be less for me. And so I don't want to share. But this story is a beautiful example of what can happen if we share what we have and then we watch it multiply. And I'm going to end with this because I want to leave you time to maybe engage in some of the activities that I shared. Another Kadir Nelson. I can't help it. I mean, look at this picture. It's so profound. This is a story about Nelson Mandela because we're global. The situations we're dealing with, it's not just here in the U.S. But here is a beautiful story of a leader who faced apartheid, who faced racism, who helped organize his people, who paid the costs by, sending, by spending several decades in prison, who came out of that and became president. But what it cost him to protest, what it cost him to organize, what it cost him to build a movement, is why I highlighted this story because it's important that we let littles, we let children know that failure isn't always the end of the story because he came out of a situation that seemingly others would have thought he failed. Here you are in jail all these decades. He emerged from that prison and became president. And from there, he went on to leave a legacy that resonates to this day. And so I end on that note of encouragement. Take the next 15 minutes, consider the materials I'm going to share. Let your light shine. Thank you so much for tuning in for tonight's, today, depending on when you watch this, caring conversation. Please take care. Continue to take care of yourself, protect your social emotional health, protect your heart, and continually tear down your fears. Breakthrough. Bye.